Welcome to this overview of the changing imagery of Hatshepsut. Now the syllabus dot point does talk about both the changing titles and image of Hatshepsut. This video will focus particularly on the image, but it would be a good idea to have next to you the table from our booklet, which shows you uh, how Hatshepsut's status changed over time and how her titles and her image also changed as, as her status changed. So that is showing from when she was the wife of Thutmose II, the, the queen, through to being the regent, and then, of course, the co-regent or king together with Thutmose III. So let's look at perhaps why that image might have changed. This is a paragraph from Kathleen Keller. She tells us that in Egyptian art, facial features and bodies were translated into ideal forms and it was according to a similar process of transformation that Hatshepsut's female nature was altered. In ancient Egypt, kingship had its own idealised graphic and textual vocabulary, and the icon of kingship was male. Now, this is a really important concept, that the icon, we're going to use this word, iconography, and I, so we're going to talk about how Hatshepsut adopts the iconography of a male king. Keller goes on to say this, If Hatshepsut desired to achieve the status and power of an Egyptian king, it was necessary that she conform to that idealised icon. In other words, she needed to adopt the male iconography in order to look like a king and have the status and power of a king. Keller goes on, her royal titulary remained clearly female and there was never an attempt to pretend that as an individual she was anything but female. But in the imagery of the statues that presented her as king, she of necessity portrayed herself as male. It was necessary for Hatshepsut to look like a real king and to have the power and status of a real king to also adopt the iconography of a king, which meant appearing to be male. So let's take a look at some of these images to see what we mean by the change in iconography. This relief is from Karnak, and on the left here, this is actually Thutmose the second, her husband. On the right, we have Hatshepsut, and you can see here that she is looking like a queen. She's got nice thin arms, and a um, breast, and she's wearing a long dress. She would also here have been wearing the vulture headdress, the neck bet headdress, all typical of a great royal wife. Then we get these things added in, the crook and the flail. Now, these were added later because these are the regalia of a king. Okay, so when we use this word, the regalia, we're talking about the different items or clothing that we associate with a king. These were added later. So Hatshepsut's gone back and done some fixing up to try to show that she was kingly all along. But if we take away the crook and the flail, we can see that she is otherwise appearing as a very normal, very typical great royal wife. Let's look at this one too. This is a statue with Hatshepsut wearing what we call the tripartite wig, which is, you know, a nice, nice, typical upper class royal hairdo for women. Uh, she would have had the uraeus, the cobra there, um, which is a sign of royalty, not uncommon for great royal wife to be shown with the wadjet. You can see here she looks like a woman with breasts and the, the nice petite shoulders. Now, we don't know exactly when this statue is from, but it's very, it's definitely from before she was a king, uh, possibly when she was great royal wife, perhaps when she's become the regent. But again, it is showing her as a woman in the typical iconography of a queen. Here we start to see a little bit of a shift. Again, though, you can see that Hatshepsut is wearing the, um, the, neck bet headdress, the vulture headdress of a great royal wife. She has the shoulders and the arms of a typical woman, nice and petite and narrow. But here she is providing incense. She's offering up incense jars to Amun. 
This is the kind of thing that normally the king would do. And this is actually a relief from a temple called Nejeri Menu at Karnak, the Temple of Karnak. And it's actually showing her as a regent. Okay, so by this stage, she still looks like a great royal wife. She's described as a great royal wife, but she's starting to do the kingly duties. But at this stage, she doesn't look like a king. And this would be normal for a regent to adopt the kingly duties, but still look like a queen. In this one, this is a graffito from Aswan. Now, Aswan is where the granite quarries were. And Hatshepsut, remember, has ordered some obelisks to be made. This is while she is still the regent. On the left here, we have Senenmut, one of the key officials, and the official who's responsible for getting these obelisks and transporting them and erecting them at Karnak. Hatshepsut is here. Now, again, you can see she looks like a woman. She looks like a queen. She's got the long sheath dress on. She's also got the... Uh, headdress, the Amun headdress, but this was a typical headdress that we associate with queens of the 18th dynasty. She's referred in this as the god's wife of Amun, so she is still looking like a queen, even though she is starting to do more kingly things like order obelisks. So again, this is when she is the regent. But let's see the next shift that takes place. In this one, which is a relief from the Red Chapel at the Temple of Karnak, again we have Hatshepsut. She looks like a woman. She's got nice thin arms and shoulders. She's got the long dress on. Um, again, she's offering up the incense jars to Amun, but this time she's gone a step further. She has here, this is ram's horns with the plumed um, uh, crown. This is a king's crown. So she has started to adopt the kingly regalia. Remember that word, the regalia. Uh, the other important thing that we see here is a cartouche that says Mart Carré. So she has adopted her throne name. She's starting to adopt kingly regalia. And in fact, in this relief, she is described as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, as well as the mistress of rituals. So it's at this point that we, we're not quite sure when this is dated to. Is she moving here to being the king? Is she still the regent? Dorman, one of our modern historians, suggests that this is the point where we say that she is the king. So this is probably close to year seven, where she's still looking like a woman, but she has adopted the throne name and the kingly regalia. And Dorman suggests that any shift to being more masculine only takes place once Hatshepsut has become the king or the co-regent. So she's not changing how she looks until after she becomes the king. So we're seeing really an experimentation with her iconography once she becomes the king. Now, Tefnan is very important in this area. He's the first one really to look at the statues and see a pattern in what's going on. And he identifies three key stages. One, first of all, we see Hatshepsut still as, as, as a female king. So her body looks female. She's still wearing a female dress, but she has adopted some of the kingly regalia and calling herself a king. Secondly, we see what he calls an androgynous step. So she starts to reduce the femininity of her body and uh, some of the clothing that she's wearing until we move to stage three, where we see Hatshepsut looking in a fully masculinized image. So by this third stage, she looks like a male king. And anybody not knowing would look at the statues and think it was a male king. Remember that she never, her titles still reflect the fact that she is a woman, but the iconography in the statues is now reflecting a male king which is the normal way in which a king with power and status is portrayed. Now, Laburi, who's you know still working in this field, tells us that this change actually took place not over a long period of time, but over a very short period of time. So if you remember, we think 
we, our evidence suggests that by year seven, Hatshepsut is king. And Labori is saying that by year eight, we've moved through these stages all the way to the fully masculinized image. So yes, there's experimentation, but it's actually experimentation in a very short time. And within a few years, Hatshepsut has understood that she needs to portray herself, at least in the statuary uh, and in the reliefs on the walls, which is what Labori has looked at. By year eight, within a few short years, she has adopted that masculinized iconography in order to show herself as a proper king. So let's look at some of these images to see if we can see these three stages. Here's stage one, Hatshepsut as a female king. And you can clearly see here in this beautiful statue made of granite that she is wearing a long dress, okay? She's got the arms and the shoulders of a female. She also has breasts, but she is wearing the Nemes headcloth um, there would have been a uraeus here. It has, of course, been knocked off and not replaced. Down um, on here, it did tell us that she was Mart Kare, so her king throne name. Uh, so she's got some kingly regalia, but certainly looking like a female. So this is Tefnan's first stage as a female king. But then we move to this kind of thing. This is what is called the androgynous stage. So her shoulders have thickened out just ever so slightly. She's still wearing the Nemes cloth, and there would have been the Uraeus here, but her clothing has changed. So now you can see she doesn't have a long skirt, but she is instead wearing the royal kilt, okay, so the short skirt type thing, which we call the chendiet, okay. So this is starting to look wear the clothes of a male even though she still has the female breasts but she's wearing the beaded necklace of the king and the uh, uh the senjet of the king she also in this statue is shown uh, with a bull's tail again part of that kingly regalia so we've got feminine ways that her name is written on the statue but we're starting to see a shift in how she presents herself. But very soon we move to the third stage, which is the fully masculinized image. Okay, now here you can see she's beefed up, all right? Have a look at how broad the shoulders are, how thick the arms are. Uh, you can also see here again the Nemes cloth, a Uraeus, but we've also added the false beard. Again, we've got the the royal kilt, the shendiet, but this time as well, we have the long stride. So instead of the uh, instead of the legs close together, we have the long stride, which we only see in males, particularly in pharaohs. So what we've seen is this trans transformation from the female all the way through to the fully masculinized image. And as I said before, Labori tells us that this all happened within a few short years. So what I'll do is I'll stop there and I'll do a second video where we look at a couple of different ways that Hatshepsut had herself portrayed with the masculinized version of being a pharaoh.